Good morning, teammates. I'm Lieutenant General Beegs Beagle, the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center. On behalf of General James McConville, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and General Gary Brito, the Commanding General of U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the 2022 version of FM30, Operations. This new doctrine represents an inflection point for the Army. It marks our official transition to a new operating concept for Army forces, multi-domain operations, or better known as MDO. You may be asking yourself, what is MDO and how does it apply to you and those that you lead? FM30 reflects an evolution of Army doctrine that retains the timeless principles of war, but is updated to meet the challenges of the current strategic environment. Our mission stays the same, to be ready, to deter adversaries, and when called upon, win the nation's wars. FM30 describes how Army forces fight. It is also a catalyst for change across the Army and reinforces the Army's culture of training and education as critical for success. FM30 will drive updates to our organizations and military education, shape the fielding of new technologies, and inform the design of new weapon systems and other capabilities critical to our Army. As you read and learn about multi-domain operations, you're going to notice that it still demands a high degree of warfighting competency from all branches and occupational specialties, and expands upon the idea that combined arms approaches require real subject matter expertise to be effective. The mastery required for success only comes through a continuous commitment to learning through education, training, and experience. Like a professional athlete, musician, or doctor, you have to do your homework. You have to put in the hours during professional military education or PME, self-study, and tough realistic training. In short, our success depends on preparation. To assist you in your preparation, my team here at CAC has assembled a mobile training team that will be coming around to centers of excellence, installations, and major organizations. Let's face it, you're busy or you have a lot to do. Not everyone will be able to attend one of our MTTs, FM30 training sessions. So we've put together a video that will walk you through the major changes to Army doctrine. The brief that follows will help you launch your preparation. It will introduce you to multi-domain operations and explain some of the significant changes introduced into the new FM30. Colonel retired Rich Creed, the director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, or CAD, here at Fort Leavenworth spearheaded the development of our doctrine for multi-domain operations and delivers this brief. Rich is an experienced warfighter, having served on active duty for over 30 years as an armor officer and commanded at all levels from company to brigade. As good as the brief will be, it cannot address every question. So we've developed a number of training support products listed at the end of the brief to further explain some of the doctrine warfighting concepts introduced in the new publication. If you still have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to CAD for assistance. Lastly, as you learn more about multi-domain operations and become masters of your craft, remember that your nation expects you to be the best. Over to you, Rich. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rich Creed. I'm the uh, director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Director here at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about the new FM30, which is our capstone operations publication, right? That means it addresses uh, the high tactical uh, operational level of war, uh, and it's designed to inform how the U.S. Army uh, and Army forces fight on behalf uh, of Joint Force Commanders. And so what that means is that all of our doctrine is going to be influenced in one way, shape, or form by the things that are contained in FM30. So this briefing by itself is not enough to make you an expert on what's in the book. We need everybody, uh, particularly folks in the leadership position, uh, to be familiar with what's contained in FM30 because it should drive uh, how we train, organize, and equip our Army uh, for 2030, okay? Uh, and so we're gonna talk through a bunch of different ideas. Again, some of them we'll get into more detail than others. Uh, but the intent here is to give you a, a general sense of, of what's in FM30 and why it's important to you. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of our operational concepts over the last 40 years. Uh, and then you can see basically we're going to follow uh, the chapters of the book. We're not going to hit every single chapter or appendix, uh, appendix um, but we are going to talk uh, about some of the information that's contained in those books or in those chapters that uh, are not listed on the agenda. 
All right, so let's talk about how our doctrine evolves over time. Now, those of you in the audience that, that have significant gray hair that, that join our army in the 80s or 90s uh, have operated according to all four of the operational concepts you see up there on the chart. And so they were all multi-domain concepts in one way, shape, or form. If you look at the name Air Land Battle by its very title, it talks about air uh, ground integration, right? And it introduced this idea of a multi-domain extended battlefield where we need to affect enemy forces beyond that immediate close fight if we we're going to have a good chance of winning. And over time, those concepts have evolved. You can see the timelines up there. And each of the years up on the chart is another version of either 100-5 or FM30 that the Army published. Why did we change those over time? Well, we changed them uh, because the world around us changed and the things that the Army was asked to focus on over time changed. So if it was large-scale ground combat against the Warsaw Pact and North Korea uh, up through the early 90s, over time there were other things that our Army was expected to do in places like Somalia, uh, Haiti, uh, the Balkans, and so forth. And so we, we moved this idea of full spectrum operations where the Army does windows, right? We don't just get to focus on one thing. Uh, we have to do all of the things that a nation requires us to do. Over time, we learned lessons. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, we realized uh, that we needed to make a few changes. And that's where unified land operations came from. All right, but even then, uh, starting in 2017, that operational environment changed. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what that did is drive us towards a focus beginning in 2017, not just on some of the ideas in that multi-domain battle, now multi-domain operations concept, uh, but also a focus on large-scale combat operations against peer threats, like a Russia or a China that can contest the US joint force in all domains. All right, so now in 2022, dated 1 October, we released the new FM30 uh, that makes multi-domain operations our operational concept still with a focus on large-scale combat operations against peer threats like a Russia, a China, Iran, or North Korea. All right, so let's talk about the reasons why here, this strategic environment. The National Defense Strategy talked about the four plus one or the two plus three, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and then those violent extremist organizations that we still conduct operations against even today. And so while the focus of this book uh, is large-scale combat operations. We recognize that the Army, from a doctrinal standpoint, has got to be able to conduct irregular warfare and so forth. We've got other books that address those types of operations, and we continue to update those books, but that's not our focus here today. It's to focus on 3.0 and that uh, preparation for and execution of large-scale combat operations against peer threats. You see the threat methods up there. Uh, they're very broad. Uh, but they are things that were distilled out by the TRADOC G2 uh, in terms of uh, the, the approaches an adversary or an enemy would be most likely to use against the U.S. joint force. And so they're pretty self-explanatory. When you think systems warfare, think uh, integrated fires complexes, integrated air defense systems enabled by a global uh, ISR capabilities. Uh, when you think preclusion, you think about them trying to keep us out of some place. Isolation, uh, you can think of in terms of either attacking our coalition partners to separate them from us, or you can think about it in terms of physical isolation of US friendly forces or allied and partner forces uh, positioned outside of the continental United States that they're trying to keep uh, the rest of the US joint force from conducting expeditionary operations to support. Uh, and then sanctuary, and we've seen sanctuary, those of us that, that were in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, but even looking at the war in Ukraine, uh, this idea that you use international borders to protect, uh, in this case, the adversary's forces from uh, interdiction by U.S. forces. We saw that in places like Pakistan or Iran uh, during the wars in CENTCOM over the last 20 years. And then people often ask, okay, so what makes uh, and a North Korea or an Iran, somebody we would consider a peer threat. Well, we, we consider them a peer threat in, in the context of where they would be most likely to conduct operations, particularly at the beginning of a campaign. They, they enjoy pretty natural advantages in terms of interior lines, uh, cultural affinity with the nations in their near abroad, the willingness uh, to move slowly over time to achieve their objectives, 
uh, and the advantages they have in terms of time and space to move very quickly to achieve those objectives before we can conduct expeditionary uh, operations out of the continental United States. They have capabilities that could contest us on all domains, like cyber uh, capabilities, or the ability to access uh, civilian space capabilities, uh, you know, to a level that was uh, unheard of 15 or 20 years ago. There are things now that are available as publicly available information to our adversaries that would have been uh, top secret classified uh, to very high levels uh, just a short time ago. And we see that uh, occurring in Ukraine uh, right before us. Uh, and, and so I already talked about the violent extremist organizations, but again, they're not something that uh, we can ignore and they are something that or they're the adversary or enemy that we're most likely to conduct operations on a continuous basis. However, but those peer threats like a Russia or China represent accidental threats to the United States potentially, right? So they're the most dangerous uh, form of conflict that the army could be asked to engage in. And what does that mean? Well, it's about accepting risk. So we're not gonna accept risk in terms of preparation for large scale combat against peer threats because you have time to adapt to a lesser threat. Right, so if you can deal with a Russia or China, you ought to be able to deal with a North Korea, Iran, or violent extremist organizations. If we were to focus on the most common form of conflict, the regular warfare, we would not be in a position uh, to win at acceptable cost uh, against any of those other adversaries. All right, so multi-domain operations. You got the description there at the top of the chart. There's a couple of ideas there that are, are important. Some of them are not new, they're enduring. Uh, as we said earlier, doctrine is evolutionary. But this idea of combined arms employment, of joint and army capabilities, that is what makes this concept multi-domain. You, as soon as you talk joint, you're talking about domains other than uh, land-centric forces, uh, you know, employed by us or our allies and partners on the ground. Uh, this other idea is that we have to create and then exploit relative advantages with this situational awareness about what's possible in those different domains. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about combined arms here in a little bit. Uh, and then to do what? To what purpose? All right, so we talk about achieving objectives. We achieve objectives short of armed conflict, right, when we contribute to conventional deterrence or what the National Defense Strategy now talks about in terms of integrated deterrence. Uh, but we also defeat enemy forces during conflict. And then we need to consolidate gains on behalf of those joint force commanders using the capabilities we bring to bear from the land uh, to achieve those long-term strategic objectives in some sort of way that's enduring. Uh, in terms of the national security, both for the United States of America and, and our allies and partners. And so below that, you see a couple of the di different ideas. So this idea of complementary and reinforcing, that's exactly what combined arms is. Uh, and this idea that we need to think about advantages and relative advantages in terms of the three dimensions of the operational environment, the human, the physical, and the information. We need to remember that in this type of operational environment, Land forces are gonna play a significant role in terms of enabling the other service components for a joint force commander. So land forces operating from land can enable the air and maritime components uh, of the joint force. And we have to get used to that idea instead of the last 20 or 25 years where the land component was always a supported component uh, by the other services primarily, right? And, and that comes into play when we talk about operations for example, in a maritime dominated environment. Uh, the concept is applicable to all echelons, right? From the theater army all the way down to squads. And, and the reason for that is we all work in, in a single operational environment that's characterized uh, by those aspects of that operational environment that are applicable to our assigned areas or our areas of operation. And so we need to be able to understand what the threat can bring to bear against us uh, in terms of the five domains and the three dimensions. Uh, and we need to understand what's the art of the possible in terms of what we can employ uh, to our own advantage against those threats. Um, they're applicable across that joint competition continuum. So we talk about context in which we conduct the operations on behalf of joint force commanders. And we talk about competition below the threshold of armed conflict. We talk about crisis and then we talk about conflict. And then lastly, uh, th this book, much like uh, in 2017, spends a lot of time talking about the importance of the defeat mechanisms and how we want to employ those defeat mechanisms in combination as simultaneously as possible to create unsolvable dilemmas. 
And you'll see that creating those types of multiple dilemmas for the threat is one of the imperatives of multi-domain operations. We have been saying that multi-domain operations, uh, that all Army operations are multi-domain operations since 2017. All right, so for most people that are familiar with our current doctrine, this is not a significant change. Uh, but what we have been able to do based on experimentation, uh, training, exercises, and, and so forth over the last five years uh, is to codify multi-domain operations into a doctrine that the current force between now and 2030 can execute against anybody anywhere in the world. All right, so let's talk combined arms, because a lot of times people talk about combined arms and they really don't necessarily remember because they haven't learned about it uh, since they were uh, younger leaders, right? And so you see the definition at the top. And it's this idea that the, the sum uh, of what you're trying to do is greater than the individual weight of each of the arms or capabilities that are employed. Right? And we want to use those capabilities in complementary, complementary and reinforcing ways. The big idea here that the quotations from Patton and Sun Tzu get to, that you're only limited by your imagination in terms of combining the tools that are available, both Army and Joint, to achieve outcomes that can be exploited to achieve uh, victory during conflict. All right, so the operational environment. This is one of the key ideas here uh, in MDO. We've had diagrams that show the, the operational environment in the past, and one of the problems with that was that they were too complicated, right? It was very hard to make them applicable at every echelon in every context. And so we think we've remedied that. So if you look at the two surface domains of the Earth, uh, with the understanding by us that there is more blue than green on planet Earth, but we're the premier land force for, for the U.S. government. So therefore, we're, we're going to have more green than blue. But then you have the uh, air over top of that and, and space over top of that. And cyberspace transits each of those other four domains. And it transits through nodes that are essentially man-made uh, and, and, and encompass both civilian and military platforms or, or architecture to, to make cyberspace work. Each of those five physical domains has three dimensions. All right, so you see on the slide that we understand those five domains, that world around us, in terms of the physical, human, and information dimensions. That's where we're trying to affect change when we conduct operations. We're not trying to change the physical world. We're trying to achieve outcomes in those dimensions that are favorable uh, to the U.S. Joint Force. We defined domains for the first time, so while the different domains were uh, defined in joint doctrine, we didn't actually define what a domain is. And when you understand that domain, you understand what the focus of each of the different services are. So if the Army's primarily land and, and the Navy is maritime, the Air Force is air, you can see that each of those services in and of themselves are multi-domain, much like the U.S. Army is, right? So there's this overlap. And that gets back to that complementary and reinforcing approach that has really been the secret sauce of the U.S. Joint Force for a very long time. The other thing we like to talk on is, is these forms of advantage. All right, and this is also one of those important things that, that's critical to understanding this. None of those forms of advantage are decisive in and of themselves, okay? You can enjoy significant physical advantages, uh, but if you're human uh, material, the, the troops that you're leading cannot execute the courses of action that you have with the equipment they have, then you really ha have got a significant problem. If you lack the situational awareness or the ability to make decisions, then you have a real problem. You can have perfect situational awareness and have forces out of position uh, in such a way that you cannot make the kinds of decisions you need uh, to defeat the, the threat. And you can look at physical, human, and information advantage using Afghanistan last year, Ukraine this year, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, a couple years ago, and just go from the very strategic down to the very tactical and, and look at physical, human, and information advantages and see how they're dynamic uh, and, and they affect each other in ways that have very significant military outcomes, right? So we strive in the U.S. Army to gain and maintain and then exploit all three forms of advantage, and we do that from the very start of the military decision-making process during mission analysis. Let's talk about those contexts I mentioned earlier. So this idea of competition, crisis, and armed conflict, there's a range of military operations that fall under that continuum, right? Uh, and, and so some of them extend from competition through armed conflict, particularly when you're talking about things like military engagement and security cooperation. Uh, other things 
uh, may start at one end and stop short of conflict, uh, particularly things like crisis response uh, and the limited contingency operations you see on the chart. Large-scale ground combat obviously is firmly all the way over to the right, whereas if you were talking about a regular warfare, it might extend uh, a little bit further to the left. The big idea here, though, is not for folks to get wrapped around the axle in terms of, of context, because typically echelons below Theodore Army are focused on one context at a time. If you're in a brigade and we're in a conflict, you're not worried about security cooperation. You're worried about defending that piece of ground uh, or conducting an attack against the enemy tomorrow. All right, so we're gonna address a few of the words here that uh, people throw around. We wanna make sure folks understand these definitions, because some of them are new. Defeat is possible without destroying the entirety uh, of the enemy that you're facing. You can defeat an enemy or an adversary during crisis just by causing them uh, to rethink what they're trying to do uh, and, and change their mind about whether they're going to uh, conduct further aggression or not. This idea of defeat in detail is important, uh, and it's uh, similar to that metaphor of eating the elephant one bite at a time. Right, when you're talking about two evenly matched uh, enemies during a conflict, you're not going to defeat them in a single battle. You may not even defeat them in a single campaign. Uh, but you can defeat bits and pieces of them at a time that accrues, uh, you know, one at a time, uh, or simultaneously in different places, and you accrue an advantage over time that creates more and more dilemmas for the threat. Right? Uh, and we'll get back to defeat in detail later when we talk about convergence. And then we've talked about defeat mechanisms in our doctrine for a while. And in this version of FM 3.0, we spend a lot more time explaining what those defeat mechanisms are uh, and, and how we think about employing them. The big idea is that you want to employ as many of them at one time as possible. And when we talk about disintegrate, which is a big idea in that original MDO concept, uh, you really can't talk about disintegrate without talking about dislocating, isolating, and destroying parts of the enemy force. So those other three defeat mechanisms are actually the tools that create uh, the conditions of disintegration uh, for the threat. We played around with the definition of, of, of disintegrate a little bit so that it isn't so technically focused and it gets to some of the softer ideas in terms of destroying the cohesion of enemy forces. And there's examples of that right, right from the real world, right? The destruction of those uh, professionals uh, soldier companies, right, the, the, the contract soldier units in the Russian army has a disproportionate impact on the ability of the rest of the formations to fight, right? When the best troops become casualties, the troops that look up to those guys and say, hey, uh, these guys are the professionals and they are getting beaten up pretty bad, what's going to happen to us, right? So there's more than just one way of looking at it. You look at it through the three dimensions, the information dimension, the human dimension, and the physical dimension. The other uh, bit here is destroy, right? You're not able to destroy the entire enemy army, right? That, there's no resources to do that, and we do not want to get dragged in to some sort of attrition style uh, of warfare. But destruction is still hugely important. And the lower the tactical echelon is, the more important destruction is uh, to the mission tasks that, that they were assigned. You see at the bottom here what the intent of multi-domain operations is. It's to attack the threat's uh, approach. And in, in past years, you've heard people talk about anti-access era denial. We address that in FM 3.0 as well. Uh, but uh, again, the employment of those defeat mechanisms in combination to accrue advantages over time is, is the big idea here. All right, so combat power. This diagram is not in the book. This is something that we, we put together just to help people envision how we're talking about combat power. So we, we are now using the joint definition of combat power, which you see at the bottom of the chart, which is really the total means of destructive or disruptive uh, force that we can bring against the threat. So combat power is what we can do uh, and bring uh, to bear against the threat. And so information helps us with that disrupt piece. It also helps us with situational awareness and decision making. Uh, survivability, when you think about uh, how we maintain endurance, it's the protection that we accrue either from the platforms we use, the tactics that we use, uh, or employing survivability measures, deception and so forth. Firepower is kind of self-descriptive. Uh, self 
And then mobility, and mobility is always about being uh, more mobile relative to the threat. It's not an absolute thing, it's always in relation uh, to who you're fighting. All of the uh, war fighting functions you see on the left contribute to generating and applying uh, combat power. And again, command and control is the integrating war fighting function that brings it all together. Leadership is that quality difference between us and who we're fighting, right? That's the secret sauce. And so when you think about leadership, you think about even in the U.S. Army, you go into two identically organized units and you walk into those places and the atmosphere is always different, right? And what's the qualitative difference between that? It's the leadership within that organization. We've had tenets in our Army and our doctrine uh, for a very long time, going back to 1982. Uh, depth has been with us the entire time because of that idea of that extended battlefield. And we think about multi-domain operations and the, the, the range constraints or lack of range constraints for things like space and cyberspace depth uh, remains absolutely as important as it always has been. Uh, we work our way up from the bottom. We talk about endurance. Uh, you, you talk about endurance because you need endurance to reach the kind of depths that you need uh, to achieve the objectives uh, or defeat enemy forces during conflict. Uh, endurance is also closely related to uh, the sustainment warfighting function. And so when we think about endurance, we think about a lot of different factors. We think about the impact of operations on units and leaders, units and soldiers. Uh, we think about sustainment in terms of how do, much uh, op tempo do we have uh, generated into the plans. And so when we think about tenets, we really want to think about uh, the way we measure ourselves in terms of course of action development, right? And so when you do a decision matrix, as we're comparing courses of action, you can use the tenets as a, as a way to say, hey, hey, does this operation reflect the degree of agility, convergence, endurance, and depth that, that we're looking for? Uh, and then if not, then what do we need to do to do that to achieve the objectives that we've been assigned? Uh, working our way up to agility, I'm saving convergence for last because that's kind of a new idea. When we think about agility, you have to, your point of departure needs to think about how Army forces actually operate. We're formations of people and equipment that move over land. And land terrain uh, is not the same as flying an airplane uh, or sailing a ship, right? You can't just turn a wheel and have the whole thing move. And so the components of, of agility start with training and leader development. They start with SOPs. They start with an understanding of your own doctrine. Uh, and then the repetitions necessary to be able to move more quickly relative to the threat. Uh, but there's other aspects of agility, right? How fast do we make decisions? How fast can we quick, uh, can we uh, collect information that inform those decisions? Uh, how fast can we move? Obviously, that's, that, that's one part. But also things like how fast can we task organize and retask organize forces across different phases of an operation? So there's a lot of components to that. And then lastly, convergence, and that's one of the tenets from the 2018 MDO concept, and we define it as an outcome. Uh, and convergence is really the business of cores and, and to a lesser extent, divisions, because large-scale combat operations are an echelon above brigade fight. And so when we talk about a, uh, an outcome and we talk about the concerted employment of all available capabilities, it drives us back into that discussion we just had about combined arms. Right? And we've extended the idea of combined arms to include those joint capabilities. And we do that with the, the understanding that we're remembering that land is still a domain, right? So when you hear multi-domain operations, the first pe thing people want to think about is offensive cyber uh, operations or the employment of space capabilities. And that's important, right? And that is what's new compared to the past uh, in the to the degree that those capabilities can have an impact on lower tactical formations. But it's those echelons above brigade that have access and, and the authorities to employ those capabilities, which are inherently scarce, right? And so the authorities necessary to employ those generally are gonna reside at the higher echelons. Cores and divisions try to establish convergence to create conditions that are exploitable by the lower echelons, right? And you can think about it in terms of that old 19th century idea of centers of gravity. Right? In the modern world, in that systems warfare approach, two opposing forces are complex, adaptable systems. Right? And because they're complex, adaptable systems, there's no one single uh, center of gravity. They have multiple centers of gravity, if you would, 
Uh, and we want to attack those uh, either sequentially or simultaneously in ways that allow us to defeat that threat in detail. Convergence helps us do that. So if tenets really apply uh, to how we want to plan and organize ourselves for the conduct of operations and then employ combat power that way, imperatives really get to the how, right? Those things that you must do if you want to win at acceptable cost. And they're really applicable uh, to every echelon from individual soldiers all the way up to theater armies or land component commands. And they should be informing how we conduct training and leader development uh, between now and 2030. The first is linked to that uh, description of the operational environment I talked about earlier. We gotta see ourselves, we gotta understand blue, we gotta understand red, we gotta understand the interaction between blue and red in any particular assigned area at any particular echelon. What can the, the threat do to us? What can we do to the threat? And what are the other factors in the operational environment around us that may serve as a constraint uh, for the employment of those capabilities. The second one is hugely important, and it, we could spend a very long time talking about what it means to account for being under constant observation. Right? Operations in Ukraine since February have made it very clear that the, the battlefield is increasingly transparent, if not absolutely so. Right? So how do we account for that? So friendly forces were always under observation in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? They knew where the fobs were. They kept track of us as we went on and off to conduct patrols and so forth. But they couldn't do much about it, could they? Never were we really at risk of having a fob destroyed. When you talk about large-scale combat operations, a fob is just a big target, right? And it's very vulnerable. So we can't operate that way. That drives us towards thinking in terms of dispersion. Uh, the, the management of our electromagnetic uh, spectrum footprint, uh, things like operation security, right? Noise and light discipline, camouflage, concealment, the employment of obscuration, tactical deception, military deception at the joint level. All of those things really drive us towards a different cultural approach to the operations we conduct. We do movements during periods of limited visibility, for example. Uh, we spread out our march serials uh, during our approach marches to a, a, a tactical assembly area or out of a tactical assembly area and so forth. Um, th the third bullet there gets to uh, what we talked about in, forms, in terms of the different forms of, of advantage. Uh, decision dominance is inherently aspirational. We don't know whether we have decision dominance uh, until the after action review or the history of a campaign is written. But what we do know is that we need to constantly strive uh, for all three forms of advantage and then exploit those forms of advantage whenever possible. The next bullet talks about making contact with the smallest element possible. So we've had to worry about uh, doing those kinds of things, at least in the maneuver world, for a very long time. In the 21st century, what's different is we have unmanned systems, and we, what we say in the doctrine is that when at all possible, you want to make contact with unmanned systems first with your robotics, with your UAS, right? And there's capabilities coming into the Army that will increase our ability to do that. But there's real implications in terms of training and leader development when you talk about simple tactical ideas like moving uh, techniques, right? Bounding overwatch. What does bounding overwatch look, for, look like for a battalion task force that now has the ability to use UAS uh, to make that first contact, right? And we've seen what happens when you don't make contact with the smallest force possible or unmanned systems in Ukraine on both sides of the equation, right? Um, imposing multiple dilemmas, I've talked about that already, but the big idea is don't give the enemy one thing to focus on, right? And we have the ability to do that at every echelon, but the further up we move in our echelons, which is why LISCO, Large Scale Combat Operations, is in echelons above brigade fight, is because the higher the echelon, the more tools that are available to create those dilemmas. And the lower tactical echelons are the execution arm for creating those dilemmas in real time in the real world. Transitions, there's all kinds of transitions. And I, I should have said this up front, but every one of these bullets has a page, uh, or at least multiple paragraphs that describe the different considerations associated with these imperatives. Transitions is one that, that we get into all the different types of transitions out there. So when you think about transitions, again, it drives you back to training and leader development. What kind of transitions are we talking about? We're talking about transitions between competition, crisis, and conflict. We're talking about transitions between phases of an operation. We're talking about transitions in terms of task organization. We're talking about uh, transitions in terms of 
uh, new information, employing that mission command approach, and then deviating from the plan uh, when conditions require us to do that. So transitions, again, it feeds right into that tenet of agility. You need agility if you're going to be able to execute transitions quickly or more effectively than the adversary or enemy. This idea of keeping the main thing the main thing, right? Designate, wait, and sustain the main effort. In any given time and in, in place, there should be a single main effort for a formation. It's going to look different for a, from a, for a platoon than it does for a company, perhaps, uh, a company to a brigade, a brigade to a corps, right? So what is the main effort? In any given time and place, it may not be fighting. It may be sustainment is the main effort as we're trying to build combat power, right? That uh, enabling operation across the wet gap may be the main effort for a division operation in a particular phase. Uh, and so keeping the main thing the main thing and making that very clear in terms of priorities of resources uh, and how we task organize ourselves is, is hugely important. This idea of consolidating gains continuously. Now that's not new in terms of what our doctrine says. In 2017, we said that we want to we uh, consolidate gains as continuously as possible. Uh, however, because it was the last chapter of the book, it always became the final phase of an operation when people will talk about it. We're doing the consolidation phase, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. So this time around, we talk about consolidating gains throughout the entire publication in each chapter during the operations that we want to conduct. All right, so to get people to think that in terms of assuming risk, you may be assuming an awful lot of risk if you're going to seize all your objectives and not consolidate gains to prevent the enemy from protracting the conflict uh, using some different form uh, of warfare, for example, transitioning from conventional to irregular warfare, uh, you're accepting more risk, perhaps, if you wait to do that after. Whereas if you consolidate gains as you go along, you plan and resource that, uh, you're probably assuming far less risk uh, in terms of the outcome uh, or the, the enduring outcomes that you're seeking during that operation that you're conducting. And then lastly, uh, understanding and managing the effects of operations on units and soldiers. So we used to do this a, a different way as recently as the war in Vietnam, right? Uh, in the last 20 years or so, how did we uh, manage the effects of operations on units and leaders? We did it with nine, 12, and 15 month rotations with R&R &R leave and so forth. We could do that because very seldom were you engaged in sustained land combat uh, for more than a few days at a time. Right? So there was time in the battle rhythm to recover from that. In large-scale combat operations, that's not going to be true. In a matter of days, and certainly in a matter of weeks, units uh, become combat ineffective due to the impact of those continuous operations on the units themselves, on the equipment, but most of all on the people. And so even in the war in Ukraine, where both sides have kind of put themselves uh, at the limit, they still rotate units out of the line to rest, reorganize, or reconstitute themselves for future operations. And so we published a book on reconstitution last year, uh, but that's something uh, that we have to, to take into account as we're planning and designing the operations that we want to conduct. All right, so we made a couple changes to the operational framework this time around. In 2017, it was deep, close consolidation and support areas. We're now deep, close rear uh, and support areas. However, that fits into a bigger picture, right? And that has not changed. The bigger picture is this idea of a strategic support area, a joint security area. So strategic support areas, continental United States and the strategic lines of communication over the, over the oceans. The joint security area is inside the theater, but generally out of the range of the majority of the enemy's weapon systems. Then we have our assigned operational areas for the Army echelons inside that. Uh, and then this idea of an extended deep area that uh, entities like uh, Strategic Command uh, or U.S. Cyber Command would be primarily interested in, or perhaps uh, components of the other services, right? So that's our area of interest. We're still worried about what's out there because there's things out there that can hurt us in our assigned areas. We have to be aware of those. That's part of that multi-domain understanding of that operational environment. But we are given missions, uh, formations at Echelon and we're assigned areas. And so for echelons above brigade, we use this operational framework, deep, close, rear, and support areas. This is a general doctrinal template. What we did a couple years ago is we went back, because the Army hadn't done this for about 30 years. Uh, and so we had some folks get together with the Centers of Excellence 
and say, what are, in a general sense, with modern weapon systems uh, fielded by the United States Army now and in the, the very near term, what would the frontages and depths of our echelons look like? And more importantly, uh, what's the relative relationship or the most likely threats in, in terms of the capabilities that they can bring to bear? So when we talk about things like deep, close, rear, and support, our point of departure is really the operations you want to conduct, right? The areas fall out based on how we, uh, we echelon forces in time and space. And we echelon forces in time and space based on the capabilities that you can bring to bear. So we use fire's capability here, but you could use ISR or, or other capabilities as well uh, in terms of friendly capabilities, unclassified, hostile capabilities, unclassified. And you start to see this correlation between our rear areas and the enemy's deep, uh, the, the enemy's rear area and, and our deep, right? And so there's this yin and yang that, that, that tends to shift as our forward line of troops moves forward or back. Right? And so there's a correlation there. The other thing that we think is important, uh, you see the diagrams there in, in terms of what the rear areas look like for a division or a corps. And during the conduct of offensive operations, those areas can grow very quickly. Right? And there's a real command and control challenge uh, for divisions and corps, and that's what rear command posts are focused on. Uh, and, and so they have got to manage terrain, and they've got to manage movement, they've got to manage priorities, uh, in terms of capabilities they may not even directly control, but because they own the area, they are responsible for positioning those capabilities, which is a quite a daunting task given the, the, the size of those areas. The last thing that, that I would leave in terms of this general doc doctoral template is it's a template. All right, so these numbers would look very different on the Korean Peninsula than they would uh, in the Iraq desert, right? They'd look very different in a non-contiguous area of operations characterized by small land masses uh, or operations in coastal areas in some place like Indo-PACOM or the Arctic, right? And so all they are is a general uh, guide in terms of thinking about the employment of capabilities in time and space. Right, so let's talk about this idea of mutual support because one of the things that those templates don't necessarily uh, make clear is that the operations we conduct within, I say, a set of operational graphics that are on a map, uh, which are inherently linear, is this idea that uh, the forces themselves, our forces themselves, are not contiguous inside those areas of operation, right? Uh, they never have been, certainly not for 100 years. And even when you show uh, lines on a map in, in a theater like Afghanistan or Iraq, which we, we all, you know, experienced, the operations we conducted within those assigned areas, even though they were fixed and they were our responsibility, they were never contiguous, right? You've got patrols out in all kinds of different places. And one of the planning factors in terms of assuming risk was always what? Can I get support to those folks if they get into trouble, right? If I have troops in contact, do I have something in supporting range to provide support? Uh, can I maneuver quickly enough to get there to, to relieve them? or reinforce them if they got into a fight, uh, a bigger fight than they could handle. Well, when you blow this up to large-scale combat operations and you think about some of these imperatives like accounting for the fact that you're under continuous observation, where you're going to have a core that has different divisions moving along different axes, right? The higher echelon has got to assume risk uh, in terms of what degree of mutual support is possible. Uh, do I have folks in supporting range? And you can mitigate that, right, with joint capabilities, right, the Air Force uh, or the Navy, perhaps. Um, however, in large-scale combat operations, you've got to have that situational awareness about what's actually available to do that. You cannot just make an assumption that air power is going to mitigate the risk but between two divisions moving on separate axes because that U.S. Air Force, the air component, may be involved in a very heavy defensive counter-air fight right, because these threats have air forces as well. So that's that dynamic that shifts uh, in terms of large-scale combat operations because all of the service components are going to be very busy. And their number one job may not be supporting us on the ground. All right, so now we're going to get into the context, the, what we expect Army forces to do chapters. So when we talk about competition, you see the, the, the definition. We talk about the roles of theater armies, which during competition, uh, command and control, Army forces in any particular theater. And what are they doing? Well, there's usually a theater campaign plan. It's generally oriented on particular adversaries. 
and you're seeking to accrue advantages that contribute to that conventional deterrence prior to a fight. And well, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is prepare for that fight in a demonstrable manner. Because again, we're under continuous observation, right? So we're under continuous observation, that means we're on stage and we're being assessed. And so those theater exercises, those combat training center rotations, um, they're all being observed and we're being assessed. So the degree to which we show ourselves capable, competent, and having the willpower uh, to exercise those capabilities with allies and partners goes a long way towards, again, creating that level of conventional deterrence. So that's our number one job. Related to that is setting the theater, right? And we're setting those theaters uh, so that we accrue relative advantages in terms of the threat. So when deterrence fails, we're not coming off our back feet, right? We're, we're ready uh, and up on the balls of our feet when indications and warnings say, hey, a conflict may be intimate. So crisis. We've had army forces dealing with crisis uh, in Eastern Europe since probably December or January uh, of this year, right? Uh, we've got two corps and some divisions over there dealing with the crisis in Ukraine. And so crisis, again, is a context. What do we expect army forces to do? In this chapter, this is where we spend a lot of time talking about force projection, the deployment of forces in an expeditionary manner from the continental United States into a particular theater, right? Because it makes sense to talk about it in this context. When there's a crisis, when there's indications and warnings that a conflict may be intimate, what are we uh, expecting army forces to do? We expect them to show up ready to fight, right? Because the conditions will change or, or it could change between home station, uh, point of port of uh, embarkation, and then the ports of debarkation across the oceans. And so when we say we're responding to crisis, the assumption going in is that we're going into a fight. Because again, being under con continuous observation, right, the threats are making assessments. And if we operate effectively, uh, more times than not, we're likely to affect that threat's risk calculus and have them back down. But that's never a given because they get a vote on that, right? Which is why we say when we respond to crisis, we, we're responding uh, because we're expecting to get into a fight. We also talk about the fact that, that those deployments will be contested. And we've got an appendix at the end uh, of this thing that we'll talk about contested deployments in the continental United States. All right, so armed conflict. The previous two chapters were all about getting ready for armed conflict when we talk uh, the chapter on armed conflict, we're talking about the execution, okay? You see the, the quote from General Grant on the bottom, things haven't really much changed uh, in 160 years. The fourth bullet down talks about the reason why we have an army, okay? We conduct offensive and defensive operations to close with and destroy enemy forces promptly during sustained land combat, okay? We talk about the roles of echelons in a general sense. They set conditions uh, for their subordinate echelons. Uh, they employ the defeat mechanisms and they fight their subordinate echelons to execute those defeat mechanisms. Why do we do it? Well, we do it to enable that transition uh, to the end of armed conflict because we've achieved our objectives and you can have a political settlement because the security conditions are relatively uh, durable because we consolidate gains as we went along. We talk about this idea of assuming risk. Um, to create opportunities. It gets back into the principles of war. It gets into this idea of uh, keep the main thing. What's the main effort? That's related to objective, right? Uh, if I've got a main thing, then everything else is supporting. So this idea of economies of force and so forth. When you're against an evenly matched enemy, creating those favorable correlations of forces requires you to assume risk in other areas to do so. And we do that not just with army forces, but in combination with the, the overall joint force that we're fighting with. So integrating echelons. Again, the, the, the safety message for this chart is we're talking about primary focus, right? So you can see how these echelons, the, the echelons fit in and we go down to brigade level, that close operations, close fight. They're focused on enemy maneuver uh, formations primarily, right? Working from the bottom up. Uh, divisions can look a little bit deeper in terms of time and space, cores even more deeply than that. We're not saying that brigade combat teams only look at the land. Obviously, there's a UAS threat, red air, and so forth. But their objectives are physical and based on the land, right? That's what we assign BCTs to do. Uh, divisions employ 
the other uh, enabling brigades, the functional and multifunctional brigades and, and other capabilities to enable that to happen. Whereas cores are set in conditions for divisions, they're fighting those divisions uh, in such a way, uh, setting conditions in time and space, looking a little bit deeper and a little bit broader. And that continues when you get up to the land component command uh, and the core level uh, in terms of Army echelons. Each one of them becomes more multi-domain the further up they go because they have access to capabilities to employ to enable that close combat and, and the seizure of objectives. All right, so we spend a, a significant amount of time talking about defensive operations, and this is different than the 2018 concept, which was almost entirely focused on offensive considerations. Right? But in the world we live in, the U.S. Army has got to be able to defend uh, the, the national interest. And our forward position forces in particular, uh, the ones overseas, whether permanently based or, or rotational, have got to think in terms of the defensive operations that they might have to conduct. So we haven't changed the doctrine in terms of how we talk about defense. Uh, there's still three forms of defense. And when you talk about uh, divisions and corps, they generally are conducting a mix of area and mobile defenses. Um, when we talk about retrogrades, though, we need to kind of make sure that we're thinking about that in terms of what's the most likely form of conflict that a relatively small uh, organization that's for deployed, whether, again, rotational or permanently based, might have to conduct uh, should deterrence fail, right? Uh, the small units, unless you, they're going to make a last stand someplace, are probably going to have to conduct retrograde uh, a retrograde operation of some form uh, with their allies and partners until the rest of the U.S. Joint Force can get there to support. Okay, so we think that training the retrograde is hugely important, and it's not just the purview of cavalry units anymore. It's got to be uh, all of our maneuver units need to think about that. Characteristics of the defense haven't changed. And when we talk about the operational framework, again, not new, but it may be new to some people who haven't thought about the defense for a long time. The close area is divided up uh, into the security area and the main battle area. And you can see the definitions there. But that's applicable at every echelon, whether it's a corps conducting the defense uh, or a, a battalion task force conducting the defense. And as I said, there are implications for forward deployed and rotational forces here. We still conduct offensive operations for the same purposes that we have. The types have not changed. Uh, you see the forms of maneuver. Uh, we talk about them a little bit here in this book, but they're from uh, the FM390 tactics. Uh, and then the operational framework considerations, and you can see those there. Uh, so when we think about the offense in terms of deep, close, rear, or support operations, there's a bunch of considerations there that the doctrine addresses. We talked about transitions as a, an imperative. And this idea of transitioning from the offense, transitioning between phases of the offense, and then addressing concerns having to do with culmination, for example, uh, are a huge part of how we plan and conduct offensive operations. All right, so we have a chapter on operations in largely maritime environments. And you see at the top, we're not just talking about Indo-PACOM. Okay, we're, we talk about the Arctic and other places where Army forces might be asked to fight. There's a lot of things that are very different. Uh, in this regard. 80 years ago, there was no more profession, proficient force in the world than the United States Army uh, in conducting operations like this. There were a million troops, uh, Army troops, in the Pacific uh, during the Second World War. We did more amphibious assaults than any other force in history. We had 24 divisions there plus six Marine divisions. Why was there all that land power in, in, in a part of the world that's defined by oceans and, and airspace, right? Because what are you fighting over? You're fighting over control over resources, populations, and land masses, right? And you see the quote at the bottom uh, by Admiral Nimitz, right? Um, so if an Admiral Nimitz could see that, it's important for us to see that and understand what the role of Army forces are. It also gets to this idea uh, that we talked about earlier, that forces on land can enable operations in those other domains. And those folks that, that you know, view themselves as history nerds of a, of a sort, when you read about the accounts of operations in the Pacific, uh, the Navy would conduct operations, but the ships would generally have to fall back somewhere to replenish, right? That's still true today. Uh, so who is staying forward and holding on to what you have while that's taking place, right? The other thing is we were securing land masses so that air power could be positioned off land and was not subject to those same kinds of requirements 
to fall back. And so we're not saying that we would be refighting the Second World War. We're saying the dynamics are still true in the 21st century, and there's a role for land forces. So what's different in terms of how we plan and conduct those operations? A couple of examples that come to mind that we address in the book. Um, the first is that when we think about uh, RSOI, uh, that order of RSOI may be a little bit different, right? We do reception, staging, and integration somewhere like New Zealand or Australia or West Coast of the United States, Hawaii, uh, because we're doing onward movement last because when we get to where we're going, we're going right into the fight. You're not going to RSOI on the beach uh, in a fight uh, somewhere in the Pacific, right? Or when you're fighting on mainland Asia, perhaps. And so we need to think about that a little bit differently. We need to think about the operational framework a little bit differently because we are really talking about non-contiguous uh, operations and that you may have bits and pieces of a brigade, a division, or a corps spread out over multiple islands. And you have to do a lot of deconfliction in terms of friendly forces in the air and maritime domains, right? Who's responsible for what? What are we trying to do in terms of denying airspace with our air missile defense capabilities or maritime spaces with long range surface to surface fires? Right? One of the roles of the MDTF is to contribute to that type of fight uh, in, in Dopeco. We've never put a chapter on leadership inside FM30 before. And this was something that the Army senior leaders said, hey, we need to take a look at this because there's a very big cultural difference between what we expect of leaders uh, in terms of how they perform in large scale combat operations and what kind of culture you need to have to be successful in those types of fights. It's not that they're radically different uh, in, in many ways than what we've gotten accustomed to. In fact, some of the things that uh, many of us were able to do, those decentralized operations, operating dispersed and so forth, we actually have you know, pretty useful experience from the recent conflicts that we've been engaged in. However, but there's a lot of other things that are different. One, that lethality of that modern battlefield uh, is such that leaders are at greater risk to themselves personally than they've ever been before. Our command posts are as well. Um, our ability to speak to one another, to communicate uh, unimpeded is, is a little bit different as well. Uh, the threat's ability to use things like electronic warfare to jam our communications or to render tox in, uh, command posts, uh, tactical operation centers. Uh, inoperative for some periods of time, all have an impact on where we think we need to position leaders. There's cultural norms that we used to have uh, a long time ago that we've never took out of doctrine, but we need to really inf uh, emphasize these things in the future. Understanding commander's intent two levels down and two levels up, right? Why is that important? Well, if you're the only one that can talk on the net, you may just become the person that's fighting uh, that particular unit at a time, right? A platoon sergeant may have to uh, fight on the battalion net and, and fight the battalion until such time that a more senior leader can come up, right? Command posts are vulnerable to destruction. There may be times where we don't want to talk to each other just to minimize our electromagnetic signature. So that mission command approach to command and control is vital. The other thing is the, the stressors, that impact of operations on units and leaders really puts a burden on, on, on leaders in terms of how they establish presence, how they keep people calm, the tone of voice you use on a radio, your ability to say, okay, I don't understand what's being reported to me through our command and control systems. I need to go there and see for myself, to look other human beings in the eye, that human dimension of conflict, and get a feel for what's really going on, what the morale is, what the attitudes are, what's actually happening. All right, but we have to balance that uh, with the risk associated with doing so. Many of the things we used to do in the past, co-locating command posts during a passage of lines or a wet gap crossing, may be unwise, depending on who we're fighting and what capabilities they can bring to bear, because you don't want to have two command posts taken out uh, in, in the same artillery strike, right? Or jammed by the same electronic warfare capabilities simultaneously. All right, so I mentioned this earlier. This is one of the appendices uh, in the book, but contested deployment. So we worked with U.S. Army North, an Army Material Command, and we talked about the things that we need to do in terms of preparation during competition and crisis uh, or conflict, uh, in terms of planning, 
coordination with all the entities involved in securing our movements from our post camps and stations to places like Beaumont, uh, the ports of embarkation, right? Uh, and so there are a whole lot of entities involved in that, and there's a whole lot of planning that has to take place, and we can't have failures of, of imagination because the threats can bring capabilities to bear. The chart talks about cyberspace and space capabilities, but they can bring lethal effects to bear against locations in the continental United States. And depending on you know, what kind of war that we would be asked to fight or what's happened already, uh, they may have very few uh, reservations about doing so, right? So we need to be able to think about that and think about all the workarounds you need to do if a rail line is interdicted or a highway bridge is interdicted that would prevent you from taking uh, and moving forces from a post camper station to where we need to go to conduct expeditionary operations overseas. All right, so here's a summary of the major changes. And we can kind of just touch on some of these. I, we've talked about most of them already. All right, so MDO is now our concept. Um, we talk about operations during three different contexts. We've got an OE model that talks about the five physical domains uh, and their three dimensions. We've got new tenants. We've reintroduced imperatives. Uh, we've re-looked uh, and re-explained how we can uh, talk about combat power in terms of what we apply against the threat and what the role of warfighting functions are in terms of generating that combat power. We've talked about the operational framework in terms of uh, the different areas and the operations we want to conduct in those areas, this idea of main and supporting efforts. Um, the theater strategic level war, we did not talk about that during this, but the senior army echelon is a theater army. And theater armies have to resolve what? The employment of land power to meet theater objectives in the context of a larger global strategic objectives, right? That's what our COCOM commanders do, and the Army is a theater, a senior Army echelon in any particular theater has a role in that. We've talked about the maritime environments and contested deployments for the first time as well. We've got uh, a ninth form of, of contact, right? So we've had eight forms of contact for a very long time. Uh, some of them we had to modify a little bit uh, to, to keep up with joint doctrine. Uh, electronic uh, contact is now electromagnetic contact, for example. But we brought influence in, right? And influence in this hyper-connected world, uh, we have the ability to influence individual soldiers even and leaders in, in adversaries or, or enemy formations, and they have the capability of doing the same to us. So this is bigger than the barracks lawyer, right, that, that's causing a disruption in a company. You've got people that can reach out overseas uh, and, and bring thousands of barracks lawyers to bear uh, on our formations and our troops. So we need to be aware of that. And then lastly, information. And we didn't talk information a whole lot. We're going to publish a book on information here in the spring. Um, but we've changed the mission variables to include information as a component for each of the MET-TC variables, right? Because of information considerations there. And that brings us back uh, into aligning those variables with human information and physical uh, advantages, those three dimensions of the OE. All right, so we've got a lot of different ways for people to access our doctrine uh, or to hear people talking about our doctrine. And I'm not going to go through each of those. You've got a link to the, where you can download three of that link. Also can uh, allow you to navigate around the, uh, the uh, Army Publications Directorate website where you can access all Army and Joint Doctrine that's not classified. We've got our own website. We are creating audiobooks for all of our ADPs and FMs and some of our select ATPs, and we take requests from the field in that regard. We've got podcasts and videos that talk uh, and discuss different doctrinal ideas. Their focus is really for our non-commissioned officers and company grade officers, but people will find utility. Uh, all people will in terms of the Doctrine Digest videos. Those podcasts get into the reason why, right? We bring subject matter experts in so that you can hear uh, why did we write a book a certain way? What were the lessons learned? What, what was the, the purpose of what we were trying to do? And we have honest discussions with the subject matter experts, including senior leaders, uh, to talk about that. So people find those pretty useful. We've got some social media outreach. And then the writing team, right? We didn't write this all by ourselves. We had a writing team that, that leveraged the capabilities across TRADOC and the operational forces we were going. But we've got 
a core team of about five uh, officers and retired officers here that wrote this book. And they're always interested, just like I am, in your feedback as you read this, right? Because we will, at some point, uh, publish a change one. Uh, and we want to make sure that we got feedback from the field. If you see something that we didn't address in some level of detail or you found a mistake, then let us know because we, we're always interested in starting that professional dialogue across the force. Okay, so we're going to open it up now for some questions. Anybody has any questions here? Yes, sir. Yeah, we didn't mention it here in the briefing. You're absolutely correct. We do mention uh, operations in urban terrain. Uh, in the book uh, as one of the factors that you take in, particularly with MET TCI, right? Uh, we published a book uh, on urban operations, ATP 306, last summer. Uh, we think it's the best one that the Army's had since we've been doing that, and we would encourage people uh, to read that uh, because we, we talk about it more than just, uh, you know, fighting block to block inside of a city. We talk about the larger considerations in terms of planning and, and what urban operations, how they fall out in, in the scope of an overall campaign. Good question. Synchronization and integration are two significant components of convergence. So when we talk about convergence in the book, uh, we break down its different uh, components. The first is the integrating of Army and Joint capabilities at the right echelon, right? So that's a judgment call by commanders. We do that. Through task organization, we do that from authorities. And then synchronization is the application of those capabilities over time and space to achieve convergence. So we address both integration and synchronization, right? And we do that in terms of the discussion we have on achieving convergence as an outcome. Yeah, so let me address the mass piece first, right? Because one of the things when convergence was still part of the concept, there's actually a slide that had a bullseye and it said convergence and had all these things going into the single bullseye. But when you read what it was addressing, that's not really what they were talking about. So when we talk about the combinations of decisive points in different domains, right, we could talk about server stacks, command posts, firing batteries, um, communications nodes, uh, other, form, other sensors that are out there, and I'm talking, I'm describing like an integrated fires command. Uh, or an integrated air defense system, for example. But that would be true when you're talking about enemy formation too, right? It's still composed of these different nodes and capabilities, uh, each of which could be considered a decisive point in terms of what the enemy's trying to achieve uh, or what we're trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis the threat. And so um, what's different than mass is we're not looking at one point, we're looking at multiple points. And then when you have effects against those points, you may have those effects via maneuver, you may have them through fires, uh, joint fires, army fires, you know, aerial delivered surface to surface, maritime surface to surface, right? Maritime air to ground. Um, all of these things, we're talking about layering them uh, in time and space. And, and you heard the units, they talk about the windows, right? Because you don't have the capability to do that continuously across the breadth and depth. You're doing it in, in specific times and places by the uh, simultaneous and sequential employment of Army and Joint capabilities. And then you get that downstream effect that accrues on a decision maker, right, or an enemy formation, or a geographical area, say you're doing a wet gap crossing and you want to prevent the enemy from uh, affecting that. So I've got to do the analysis to think about all the things that can affect us as we're crossing uh, that river, uh, for example. Uh, and then I want to employ capabilities in such a way to keep them from doing that. So it's very different than mass. Mass may have uh, a piece of that in terms of I need to destroy something, so I have to mass fires on that one location. But it's bigger than just that one decisive point. It's multiple decisive points. In 2017, we used the word convergence because we didn't like the definition as it was. We used the plain English uh, use of the word uh, in there. And when we revise all the rest of our doctrine based on 3.0, we're going to have to change that in, in multiple publications to use convergence as we describe in, in, in FM 3.0. Did I answer that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I think the first thing in terms of affecting the lower tactical echelons, companies, platoons, is to have a, f a firm idea and understanding of that operational environment model in terms of what's out there that can hurt me and what my higher 
maybe me if I'm assigned something, right? I have a Ford Air Controller perhaps, right? Um, or a TAC-P or, or somebody that, that can employ capabilities to support my company or platoon. But it's really about seeing ourselves and seeing the threat in, in the OE and then understanding what my hire is doing to enable freedom of action for us. And I wanna understand that two levels up, just like you want your squad leaders to understand what your intent is as a company commander, right? The other thing is I would say that the, particularly from a large scale combat operations perspective is from the very beginning, from the time we're commissioned or we become non-commissioned officers is to always look at, at how I can employ combined arms with what's available to me and then my next hire headquarters. And everything we do should be seeking to create dilemmas because I'm employing combined arms to the maximum possible extent. And that'll look different in an MP company than it would be in a tank company team or, or a striker company, for example. But the dynamic is still the same. Was that clear enough? Okay. So what we say in FM3O is it's the principal tactical formation during large-scale combat operations. And we say that because the vision is the first echelon that has access to those multi-domain capabilities and allocates them down to the lower tactical echelons and then employs them uh, to enable success in, the close, in close combat, in the, in the close fight. Um, that doesn't mean they're necessarily the most important formation in any given time and space, right? Because if we say cores are the headquarters that, uh, that uh, achieve convergence to enable division freedom of action, right? Then cores are important too, just like BCTs are important for the divisions to be able to achieve their objectives. But it's the principal tactical formation because it's that sweet spot that reconciles close operations with deep uh, rear and support operations and brings it up to the echelon that, uh, the echelons that are concerned with campaigning and operations over time, right? On behalf of the Joint Force Commanders. Um, so that principal tactical formation uh, gets you to the idea that BCTs aren't the only thing that matters anymore. They're not the coin of the realm because all of the functional and multifunctional brigades and battalions that enable divisions to fight as formation, that's the level where that kind of comes to fruition. It also gets to the idea that large-scale combat operations are uh, an echelons above brigade fight. And a look at what's happened in, in Ukraine on both sides when you tried to have you know, essentially a two or three star headquarters uh, and then you're fighting multiple battalion sized units, that lack of an echelon there really impeded the ability to achieve combined arms or to coordinate uh, the employment of forces in time and space in any sort of coherent and synchronized matter or manner. And so that's why division, we say that divisions are the principal tactical echelon during large scale combat. Anybody else? Yes, sir. We've talked to the Army Sea Leadership several times, and while it was a joint function, we thought information was too important to make it the purview uh, of one community, right? It's an enabling function for every other warfighting function. Uh, and it, it has an applicability in terms of enabling decision making, uh, protecting friendly information, informing uh, audiences, influencing uh, audiences, uh, or attacking a threat. Right, and so all Army capabilities have an information component uh, and need to think about information, and that's why with the, the mission variables we talked about an information component to each of those variables. So we didn't see a need for that for the Army and Army forces the way we conduct operations. Information is everybody's business, uh, much like thinking about protection as an outcome is everybody's business and not just the purview of, say, a functional cell on a division or core staff. I would talk about it in terms of each of the components of the mission variables because it may not be critically important depending on what echelon you're talking about in every single, in every single context. And when you think about the three dimensions of the OE, right, that kind of takes care of itself. When I'm doing mission analysis and I'm thinking about, all right, I've got information considerations, I've got physical considerations, I've got human considerations, both friendly and threat. Uh, particularly when you don't have a staff, right? You're at the company level. You're doing that yourself, maybe with the help of the first sergeant and the XO. And with staffs, you have the, the ability to do that as well. But we think it, 
over time it, be, it becomes second nature in many ways. And when you look at yourself through that framework of the five dimensions or the five uh, domains and the three dimensions, uh, you think about terms in ter uh, threats and then our friendly capabilities, right, in terms of physical, human, and informational. When you say recent conflicts, you're talking about the conflicts in Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, and so forth. I would tell you that as we were writing this, we were thinking not just of the conflicts that are in the news right now while we were writing it. And both of those conflicts, Ukraine and Garner Karbach, happened while we were writing this, right? Uh, but we were also informed heavily by our experiences over the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the influences of it is how we talk about the operational environment, right? Because at one point we were thinking, well, maybe we should just talk about physical and cognitive sides of things, right? Um, and in conversations with Army senior leaders, we said, well, that, if we do that, we might run a risk of forgetting the importance of the human dimension of warfare and, and conflict. Uh, and it, so it was that experience you know, that our Army earned the hard way over 20 years that kept the human in there. And it wasn't just about information and physical. It's human information and physical because there's that human dimension to everything we do. In terms of the recent conflicts, um, we think that uh, what we've observed up to now, and it's too early to say, you know, everyone's got all the lessons yet, right? Because we don't have all the information. But we think that the events that have unfolded over the last several years have confirmed our, our vision of warfare and what needs to be done to succeed, uh, starting with ideas like combined arms, right? So when you had the opening uh, battles in, in this current war in February, there were people talking about, you know, the initial cyber attacks. Uh, you know, they were very disruptive. Then the counterattacks against the Russians in cyberspace were very disruptive. Um, you had people talking about UASs and, and their, their ubiquitousness. Um, I will tell you, the first thing that popped into my head was, where are all the Russian infantry, right? Why are they not dismounting and just doing simple turning movements on roadblocks on the road? And I mean, I went right to the combined arms piece right off the bat. And then why were these battalions, uh, these battalions conducting attacks unsynchronized with battalions on their left and right? You know, where was the depth in terms of thinking about their assigned areas uh, in terms of deep, close, and rear? And where was that joint integration uh, by, with Russian capabilities in terms of enabling the operations they wanted to conduct? They all seemed to be absent or they were, uh, happened in fits and starts and it didn't seem to be about right. And so things like that resonated with us and, and told us that we, we think we've got this about right. Uh, there were other aspects that, as we observed, we wanted to reinforce in FM 3.0. So we spent a little bit of time um, re-examining how much we address close combat, close operations in there. We took a look at the idea of convergence a little bit and did some refinement in that regard. We emphasized, I think, a little bit more uh, that human dimension in terms of the importance of training, right, competence. And then in the leadership during operations piece, we, we emphasize that this isn't all about commanders, right? That mission command approach requires a professional non-commissioned officer, officer corps and uh, very proficient staffs to be able to do these things. You can't operate on a mission command approach without good staffs, without a, a professional non-commissioned non officer corps. Um, and then, again, back to the leadership piece, you know, one of the reasons why there were so many Russian field grade officers and general officers killed was they were forced to go and lead from the front because they didn't have subordinates who understood the big picture, who understood the intent, and they could operate with mission type orders. So all of those things, we, you know, came together in our, in our collective heads in one way, shape, or form, and allowed us, I think, to refine this a little bit more. Yeah, so we acknowledge the, the role of, of the technology and, and not just um, technology in and of itself, but on the capabilities that might uh, be available. But we didn't want to constrain ourselves to things that may or may not be fielded, for example. So we wanted to keep it back to the big ideas on what is available, both Army and Joint. And we wanted to address also expectations in terms of scarcity, 
right? So when, one of the reasons why we talk about the main effort is because certain capabilities, whether they're joint army, are going to be inherently scarce. Everyone is not going to get their fair share. So we didn't want to set expectations that there will be some technological solution that will enable you to execute the tasks that you were assigned. You need to think about in terms of what might be available, uh, but not base your entire uh, planning process on the assumption that those things would be available. The other thing, there's a lot of the technological sides of things that are very dynamic, and you could, you could actually make the, the doctrine fall out of date if you talk to specific systems too much. So it was very common for us to get phone calls about, when are we going to put robotics and AI in the doctrine? Well, we didn't put robotics and AI into this doctrine um, because until someone shows us that robotics and AI will allow us to fight differently instead of better, uh, then we don't really need to change. It would be like, do I need to change this doctrine because our artillery can shoot 20 kilometers further? No, right? Because we can fight better, right, more effectively. Um, but we're not really fundamentally changing how we fight. And the other, I think, useful metaphor or simile might be, you know, in 1982 when we uh, had the first airland battle, 100-5, we described a world uh, in which the Army had to do certain things if it wanted to win. Uh, but that Army was not equipped with the things that were envisioned for it to have uh, at the time, right? We didn't stop fielding the things for airland battle till the late 1990s across the entire Army. Well, the same is true now. So this book talks about the things that we need to be able to do if we want to win. But all of those tools aren't necessarily available yet. But if we were to fight tomorrow, we need to fight this way. Uh, and it won't be as great as it will be in 2030 or 2035 when we have all of these capabilities that we're fielding, um, but we'll be close. That's a great question. In fact, General Rainey asked us that question when he was a CAT commander. He says, do we want to do that? And we said, well, we don't think so, sir, because we've got pretty mature doctrine uh, and doctoral publications that go into some depth in terms of the employment of those types of capabilities, right? Um, what's different on the, the maritime side of it is it's part of the surface of the earth, right? And so there's only a limited amount of people that are ever going to be up in space. Uh, there's certainly no people in cyberspace, not real people, right? It's virtual. Um, and, and the air piece, again, is, is relatively transitory. But the two places on the earth um, where you are actually physically moving the bulk of your forces are going to be air uh, and sea or air and maritime, I mean land and sea or land and maritime. And so uh, the other thing I think that, that we were thinking about is, again, people conceptually understood that, but the one thing we hadn't addressed, even though the Pacific pivot, right, was 10, 10 years ago, was what do we expect of Army forces in a place like that, surface of the earth, uh, into PACOM or the Baltic or Arctic uh, or any of those other environments. So that was the reason why. Yes, so we're going to do a top-down, bottom-up approach. Uh, the top-down is what we're starting with. Uh, so the ADPs will be updated over the next 18 months to two years. We're hoping for 18 months because a lot of the multi-domain operations concept ideas are already out there in one way, shape, or form, but there will be refinement necessary in those ADPs. Um, some of the ADPs and FMs will be done in tandem, just like we, are, we did FM 3.0, and we were working on ADP 3.0 uh, at the same time. So FM 2.0, ADP 2.0, FM 4.0, ADP 4.0, they'll be worked in tandem. The others will be worked individually. You know, we've got three or four that uh, the Combined Arms Doctrine Director is responsible for that we will get to as well. And then the branches, Across the branches and warfighting functions, they'll start working the field manuals uh, as quickly as they can. But quality is job one, right, not speed. Um, and so it's going to take two or three years before we get the bulk of, of the, uh, the hierarchy of doctrinal publications revised to be completely aligned with FM3. Yeah, I could talk about it a little bit, and I, I, I kind of gave a hint there, but I think it's the imperatives that really will have the most impact on training with the tenants right behind in terms of 
um, the development of uh, staff officers and officers in professional military education, NCOs as well. Uh, but those imperatives, uh, in many ways, shapes or, or forms, are already part of the operational environment we provide brigade combat teams and their division staffs at the combat training centers and in the MCTP warfighter scenarios. Uh, so that has already begun. Right? We've had a list go focus at the training centers and in MCTP warfighters going back to at least 2016. I think the CTCs might have been even 2014. Right? So that has already begun. And one of the things that have to uh, be affected, most of all, are going to be in the details. Right? Now we have the exact tenets. Now we have what the imperatives are. Now we have an operational environment model uh, that can be applied uh, and then driven into the programs of instruction across the different schoolhouses. Uh, the combat training centers, and then used at home station as well. Yeah, so we've said, oh, going back to 2017 edition here, we, we've talked about this. Um, we always say that Army forces are going to be part of an overall joint force, and in most cases will be part of a multinational coalition with allies and partners in one way, shape, or form. We continue that in this book as well. Our multinational uh, allies and partners can bring capabilities to bear uh, that we necessarily can't, right? So the U.S. Army has a big tent approach. We want to be able to fight with anybody who fights with us. So we've got uh, a lot of imperatives going on within the Army right now, Project Convergence and so forth, um, that are all about Army, Joint, and multinational interoperability with our command and control systems, how we employ fires, how we maintain a common operational picture and so forth. And so 3.0 touches on those ideas uh, in a broad sense, but we've got other publications that get into it in a little bit more detail. But that's an ongoing process across the .mil PFP. And the doctrine piece which simply sets the stage for saying, hey, we've got to be able to operate with our allies and partners because they bring capabilities to bear that we need uh, as part of an overall multinational team to achieve our objectives. Anybody else? All right. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. I would ask those of you that haven't read this yet to read it and tell your friends and neighbors to read it as well, because we need cards and letters from the force uh, to help us make this thing better and start that professional dialogue across our army to argue about multi-domain operations in the same way that we argued over air land battle for 15 years, right? So let's, let's get out there and start that. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.